Howdy everybody. We're going to do a in-depth video rebuilding a specific car component. I've posted videos on this component before but I have another one to rebuild and I figured I'd go in-depth. Um, there were one or two questions on my videos that I had to go back and clarify in the comment sections and I just would like to um, go through everything, the complete process of how I did it. And it is this. A old school car clock. This particular one is for a 1970 to 72 Oldsmobile A body. So your F85, Cutlass, Cutlass Supreme, 442s, all of those variants, Vista Cruisers, uh, Cutlass Wagons, clock for all of those. Um, this one does not work. Totally seized up. Um, the, those of you who don't know, these are case ground units. Um, there's a grounding strap that this bolt right here goes to. You apply 12 volts here, and these are for the lights. Um, this clock is, um, we've tested it out on our test battery, and we've grounded out the case. We've run that wire to the 12 volts. does not work. It clicked once but it does not move. So we're going to go through and show you guys exactly how we rebuild this. Um, the most tricky thing for me is getting this knob off and it does need to be painted. The knob is in pretty rough shape. Sometimes they're black and sometimes they're chrome. So you have to make sure you have the correct knob. If you have a chrome knob that looks like this, it's in bad shape, you're going to have to buy a new one, but we can get away with sanding this down and spray painting it. It's going, for those who are wondering, it's going in the Vista Cruiser. The clock is not, it's in very good shape besides it not working, but it is by no means perfect what I would put in a show car. This is a good driver clock. Now the one in the Cutlass is a mint condition clock that I found in a non-working condition for the same price as this one. So not as lucky, but this will match the other gauges in the Vista Cruiser much better. We're not doing any quartz conversion or anything. We're keeping the analog points system in the clock. It is less accurate. It takes more adjustment to make sure it shows the correct time. But I like my cars to be original as they come. So the first step, we're going to do two things. We are going to try and loosen up these three bolts. Now the problem is, or nuts I should say, these are steel nuts on aluminum posts. The problem with that is there is um, corrosion. Aluminum does not rust, it corrodes. And when aluminum and steel rust together, or iron, it is called galvanic corrosion. So the problems we're going to be having is we're going to loosen up these nuts, and the post is going to spin with it. So a lot of times, this is one of the questions, how did I take the face off? Um... You have to go through, and you can see the post right in there. You'll have to take a needle nose pliers, or a needle nose vice grips is what I actually use. Go in through the outlet for the light, hold the post, and loosen it up. And the most tricky one to get is the one back there. It is it's tucked away in there, so that is definitely the more difficult one to get. But this one, I've noticed, I have taken apart three of these successfully rebuilt one so far and I've noticed this one so far has always come loose for me um, an impact also doesn't hurt a little Milwaukee impact definitely has a greater chance of breaking the nut free without moving the post if you go at this with a ratchet all that torque is without the hammering action of an impact is most likely going to spin the stud along with it so I highly recommend a small quarter inch three eighths impact on this doesn't have to be a Milwaukee whatever you have pneumatic electric um, does not matter the second step we're going to take are from the factory there are these four crimps at 90 degree clockings on the on the clock body these hold this outer ring in which holds the lens on so in order to get the lens off to take the needles off to get the face off you first have to loosen up this knob you have to pull it out, hold the post, and it just threads off. 
Sometimes these clocks are so seized you can just thread it off by hand. Uh, this is not the case. It does adjust, luckily. It is difficult, but it does adjust. So you have to take the knob off. Then you have to bend these four. I like to take a chisel and just tap them very gently, very gently. But take a chisel and ch chisel and chap tap each one. Then this ring comes off, the lens come off, the needles come off. And then with these four posts off, the whole face will pull out of the clock body. And you will see the gear, the coil, the point, and the automatic advance unit on the clock. And I will explain all of these later, but let's start taking it apart. Okay, so we have started taking the clock apart. And speak of the devil, if we look in the bottom, these two posts came off, but this one on the bottom is the one that is seized. It is spinning with the nut, as a, you can see. See? So there is going to be a pain. We also took off the 12 volt supply blade connector because that will interfere when we try and take the movement out. But as you can see, we're all getting, we're already starting to see it wanting to pop out. So I'm trying to remember from the last time I did this. Um, another trick that I use, I do not use a chisel actually. I do not use a chisel when I'm working on the, um, the crimps on top. What the best way to do it is to take a needle nose, go like this on the crimp, like that, and then just pull it back like that, and it will straighten out just like that. Um, I did have to take a vice grip, I had to pull this out, put a needle nose vice grips on the shaft, and then put a pliers on the knob to loosen that up, and then. Be very careful when removing these needles. They are extremely fragile. We're going to try and clean up that centerpiece as much as possible. Um, potentially take one of our chrome touch-up markers, one of these right here, and try and make it look good if cleaning it does not work. Another important thing is you have to note the order in which the knobs, or the, in which the hands come off. In our case, on the wider base, it goes hour hand, then minute hand on the upper. And then the second hand seats right in the middle. And most of the time, you can tell. Um, I know this is a newer clock, so if you go back to the 40s, this may, they may not be designed in such a way. But you, you cannot put them on incorrectly. The hour has a much wider base than the minute, which corresponds with the stepped shaft in the center just like that so the next step is well we can't get a needle nose in through the light socket all the way back to this stud so what do we do well there are three tabs that hold the face on you need to push down pull them out and each spot and the whole face will lift off the clock so after you do that no, we won't even get to tell you. We'll just do it. Oh, and, and one other tip. When you put this in the vise, be very gentle. There are, on these particular clocks, there is a flat spot. There are two flat spots. You can have a flat spot on one side of the vise and have a round spot on the other, and that will help with any sort of turning. So this is in there quite loose, actually. Um, but it does not want to turn, and it does not want to move. So very a, a firm but gentle grip with the vise. So let's pop this face off and let's keep trying to get this stud out. So I did forget to tell you guys one thing about these tabs on this particular clock. And I apologize for the heater, but I gotta keep it warm in here. So these tabs, when you go to take these out, you're not gonna even actually see what you're doing. So you see I have a pick, take a 90 degree pick like this. If you go in here, you're gonna try and push this tab and it's not gonna budge. Because what you have to do is you need to go under like this. The tab goes down and then it is bent over. So the tab comes down into the groove and then it bends over. So underneath this plate, the tab is right here. So you have to come down behind it like so. I'm trying to show you guys exactly. So you have to come down, 
behind it like this with the pick pointed up like this so you actually get behind it you have to try and bend it back and it can be challenging I've already got one done And it really, it's not a challenge of actually doing it. It's just a challenge of finding it because you just can't see what you're doing. There we go. We got it. Now, so you can see a little bit of it right there. And you come back behind it with the pick. And it should pop right out. There we go. We keep trying to get it. There we go. So that's one done right there. So they are a bit of a pain to go in from the front because they're designed to be assembled from the back and then just dropped into the body of the clock. So we are going to get this last one done, pull this out, and we'll move on to the next step. As you can imagine, those tabs are much easier to do when you're not holding a camera. But I got the last one. So that's all you're trying to do is bend those out. You're not going to be perfect at it. Some of them are going to be a little misshapen. But that's fine. Try and touch the face of the clock as least as, um, as possible. And here's what I'm talking about. Why these studs like to spin. Because they're just crimped in. See? That should not be spinning like that. So you get the corrosion. You get right here. Aluminum plate. Aluminum stud. It's a soft metal. It will move fairly easy. So what I like to do in this scenario it's kind of risky i don't recommend it unless you are comfortable with accidentally destroying the clock is um you still can't get at it these two right here you can get at fairly easy because there's this relief cut our very our, our last scenario our last case scenario is we cut a little bit of the plate but i don't like to do that because there's gears behind there you gotta be you have to be deadly accurate when you do that so what I like to do is I will rest the base of the stud like that on the vise and then I will take a hammer and I will pound that crimp down just a little bit more to try and tighten it up and then again with the impact try and do that and just keep doing that and eventually it should come undone. Um, I've done that on these up here when I've had to. But this is the second worst case scenario for getting this out. The other one is drill it out and um, you're going to have to like epoxy a bolt in or a stud and try to do that. That is, or if manufacture your own stud and crimp it in. That would be the best thing to do if you end up having to destroy it. But that takes time. Not everyone has the tools to do that. So we're going to try and tighten that crimp up and take that nut off. So unfortunately, this is how it goes sometimes. We have the assembly out of the clock body. So what I had to do is I just had to tear the stud out. I Those two are already loose. So we just pulled up a little bit and it popped right off of the stud. And here's the other problem. So I took the nut and the stud came with it because the aluminum was weak. So the stud actually is broken. So we'll have to figure out a way to make something work, potentially a bolt. I'm really not a big fan of the bolt idea, but we need something. So we'll see what we'll see what we do. Uh, the only reason I don't like the bolts is because you can't. Um, you need a way to assemble it. But anyways, the. Uh, clock is apart and um, I'm suspecting I've taken these apart before they're fairly simple you can, you can lubricate these I heard I've heard I heard recently you can lubricate them with motor oil um, WD-40 really isn't the right thing to use um, really um, oh gosh I forget forget there's a proper oil that's used by clock makers that people highly recommend but we're going to um, just talk about these components. 
um, the ways they can fail. So the most uncommon method of failure I've seen is mechanical failure, is um, gear failure, where a gear is actually broken or missing. Um, I've never seen it happen on all the clocks I've rebuilt. I've done three. Um, another failure, another more common failure is that the points burn up. So, like everything on old cars, it's run on points. And just like the points in your ignition, they get a little crusty. So, I always like to clean those up. And another common failure is that the coil's bad. Now, if the coil's bad, you're pretty much screwed. Because nothing can fix a coil. You can try and rewind a coil with copper wire. You're never going to be as good as the factory. It's not going to work. Um, and... Unfortunately, that might be what's wrong here, but there's no way to know until we rule everything out. Um, that's again, that's why it's nice to have a parts clock. So we're going to blow it out with some compressed air, clean the points. We're going to run the points all the way down. So right now, this should be spinning. There is a, a movement in here that should be spinning. I'm trying to find... Here it is, right there. That movement. Oh, sorry, it's so blurry. I'm looking at the clock, not at the screen. There is a movement right there. That wheel. So the way these old clocks operate is these points, the only electricity these clocks use is to wind the clock. Um, and it's only when these points contact. So these points move further and or closer and closer together until they contact. And then this coil operates, which acts as an electromagnet. And it swings. Is it electromagnet? No, I believe it's actually a mechanical. It pulls a spring. And what that does is that pulls the points back open to a certain point. And then that has a that puts tension on the movement. I'm not a clock builder, so my terminology is not quite right, but that puts Tension on this spring, which pulls down right there, and then that starts the movement moving again. Um, and if there is no tension on that spring right there, that wraps around the movement, or that wraps around the points wheel right there, um, then the movement stops and the clock stops. So it's only using 12 volts every minute and a half, two minutes, depending on the clock. And um, it's only to move the points open. The, otherwise, the clock is, it works without electricity. So we're going to blow some compressed air through here. We're going to try and, um, we're going to try and lubricate it, uh, clean it and lubricate it. Compressed air is not going to, but we're going to try and clean it and lubricate it going to clean the points up we're going to try and get that movement working again and i think once that movement starts working we're going to be just fine and then it's um just a matter of the points actually returning to where they're supposed to because of the coil so we'll blow it out we'll clean it and we'll see if we can get this to start working all righty guys through the magic of movies, we can fix the clock. Ordered this. Um, so basically what happened is this spring fell out of the clock. It used to be a spring. And it is no longer a spring. So this is junk. This is junk now. I mean, we can use it for parts, but it's junk. And really rare to find these, but I actually found one on eBay. It is an original timepiece replacement. It's not a quartz conversion. It is still an original points setup. It's so just... It is still an original points clock. Working exactly how it's supposed to. Points close, movement eventually stops. Just give it a second. 
slowing down. There you go. And it is now stopped. The only problem is these prongs are different up here, as you can see. So, all these clocks were made by Borg Warner. So, we're just going to do a quick, simple switcheroo. Drop that down there. We'll have this as a spare for anything. If we ever need to convert, we could probably take that off and move it over to this if this coil ever goes bad or if this coil ever goes bad so we're just gonna swap these around we'll clean up this point because it's still pretty dirty pop that on we'll toss the clock back together and should be ready to go okay so the clock is going back together and um, this is what i'm talking about um they go together a lot nicer because you can bend these tabs just while they're out like this. I mean, that's pretty convenient. And this is what we're gonna have to do for the stud. So it does work. I've got a nut that's tightened down. Then I have two nuts jammed up against each other at the same height as the stud. So is it ideal? No, would I do this in a restoration? Absolutely not. But you're never gonna see it. This is not gonna, I'm not planning for this to be a show car, just a driver. And that's gonna work. That, that, I'm happy with that. That is a proper fix in my book because it's it remains the structural it it maintains the structural integrity and it does not compromise the look of the car. So to me that's that is an acceptable fix for a non-restoration car. Um yeah. Um it's going together really smooth actually. I just got to put the hands on. I got to get this nestled in the body. You got to reassemble the lens and um, still have to paint that knob. We're just going to get some sandpaper, sand it down, paint it real quick, and we'll install it when we get a chance. We got to put bulbs in, and then we got to pop the bezel out of the car, slot this gauge in, and look at that. We're going to have another factory option in the Vista Cruiser. Seems like every time I want to record, the heat kicks on. But a nearly fully assembled clock. Um, I would like to get a new lens in it eventually. I'd like to put new lenses in all the gauges eventually, but for now it matches. There are small black spots you can see. Those are not coming out. I've tried polishing this piece. They're, they're stuck in. Um, still gotta paint the knob. But I did want to tell you guys something. Uh, a lot of people on these old cars, they just go all willy-nilly and they don't um, put the right bulbs in. There are certain bulbs that will fit this and certain bulbs that will not. And um, especially with your warning lights, um, this doesn't necessarily apply to the clock. Only one type of bulb will fit that, but there's 164 and 194 bulbs. Um, and they take two different amps. So I know that the, like for instance, the coolant light is a 164 bulb, which takes less amps to il illuminate fully. So, if you have the wrong amperage in the bulb, your warning light is not going to malfunction. It's not going to indicate correctly when your engine is overheating and you can actually damage your engine because you put the wrong bulb in. So, they have them in all cars. If you guys have access to this, if not, there are PDFs of this online that you guys can look at. Check the bulbs before you put them in, especially in the gauges, they're very important courtesy lights are not so important dome lights are not so important but your especially your warning lights it's extremely important you guys know that you have the right bulbs in there because they could save your motor I mean they're called idiot lights for a reason uh, not because an idiot installed the wrong bulb it's called an idiot light to help you from being an idiot we've all been there with idiot light but we'd like it to work and stop us from being idiots. So make sure you have the right bulbs in. Let's go put it in the car. Okay, you can hear it. You can hear the clock. There it is, we have another one done. So now we're cruising down the road. Yes, uh, ignore that. I have the lens at home to make it this blue color.
I just have to uh, put it on. But there's another clock. Oh, perfect. This is how it's supposed to look. I would have put a TikTok tack in if I could afford it, but I'm not going to spend $400 on repop gauges or $800 on new old stock gauges. So this is good for now. Oh, there, it just clicked. Ah, oh, it's perfect. So perfect. Very happy. Another project done on the Vista Cruiser.